morning. It is a wonderful Sunday morning, despite all of us being both here and out there. We are together in spirit, maybe just not necessarily in body. There are a few announcements that still need to be said. Uh, first is that there have been fluid changes, and I would encourage you to continue to stay in contact with us in any way that you know how. We have the website, Facebook, as well as email. We, I would encourage you to keep checking those places for updated information. We are canceling Lenten Soup Supper this week and the meeting that was planned for the vision on that same day. We also um, will be still accepting donations for the Huffman family. For those of you who don't know, their son has been battling knee cancer and had his uh, leg removed and is getting a replacement. So we'd ask to keep them not only in our prayers, but if you would like to donate support, you can mail in or drop off your check. Make sure you're writing the Huffman family in its um, memo line. Also, youth group has been canceled. Easter flowers are still for sale. So if you would like to purchase Easter flowers, you can send in your money and your order by April 5th, and we will have those for Easter, hopefully, if this situation doesn't change. I think that's all the announcements I have this morning. So let us just get started. We're gonna do things a little differently today because you, as I said in my letter, we won't be able to have music today, but hopefully soon we can hear the music in our hearts. Let us together join in the call to worship, saying it all as one. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. That we may share God's love and life, may we be renewed in the refreshing spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Lord God, great I am. You are living water. As we worship you this day, show us who we are, channels of your love and vessels of your grace. Through Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. First reading today, the Old Testament, Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. Water from the rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirst there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring out us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it. 
so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Messiah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And the second reading from the New Testament, John 4, verses 5 to 42. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where did, do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give you become to them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the waters seek such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? or Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, 
I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here are the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, <clears throat> empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me and open the hear ears of the hearers here and out there today that they may hear what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from this message into their lives and into the world. Amen. Lately, I've heard many people express that they are concerned I'm not taking care of myself and protecting myself during this critical time. I know deep inside that this comes from a place of love in their hearts. But if I'm being honest and open, it hurts when they say this. It makes me feel as if they're saying to me, you don't know how to care for yourself, so let me tell you how. In my head, I'm thinking, I've been on this earth for almost 39 years. I'm pretty well educated. I've been through more than most people my age, and I know more about my brain cancer than many doctors do. Sure, I don't know it all, and I have much to learn, but it hurts that people think they know what's better for me than I do. Again, I recognize that this comes from a place of love, and as such, I let go of that hurt. However, I think this displays how many of us don't realize what we say and how it can come across as an expression of superiority. It implies that we believe our personal ideas are in some way superior to another's. In these past weeks, we've seen Jesus' call for us to give up control, thinking we know better than God, to give up preconceptions that distort how we view others. And in the passage today from the reading of John, Jesus' actions display his call for us to give up our superiority and related judgments. Now, although we aren't given this in the passage, it's important to understand verse 4 prior to this passage in order to put this story into context. As you know, context is vital in reading biblical text as well as for any situation. 
Verse 4 states that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Many have interpreted this to mean he had no choice in this, but this is simply untrue. Sure, Samaria was located between Judea and Galilee, and you would think that it's along the way. However, more often than not, Jews would go the long route around the East Bank to avoid the Samaritans who they believed were inferior to themselves. Jesus purposely goes this way because God so loved the world, which includes those who we think are inferior to us for one reason or another. Jesus had to go because it was a part of his mission, just like he had to go to the cross because it was his mission. In our daily lives, we don't recognize when we are allowing our superiority to get in the way of our own mission. Sometimes we're also undermining others' missions for the sake of our own feelings of superiority. I can't tell you how many times this week that I've heard people say, we have to do it this way or that way because of the assumption that they know better. This is really a way we let our unconsciously perceived superiority supersede our call to see everyone through God's lens, even if their ideas differ. Again, by putting it into context, we see that Jesus chose to engage in conversation with this woman at a shared space. A well that, as the woman pointed out, was dug by a shared ancestor to common to both the Samaritan and Jews. What is being implied here is that Jesus is trying to find common ground first. We know he is putting his superiority aside to do this because in that time, it was viewed as a negative thing for a man to just hang out and have a conversation with a woman. Furthermore, they were there at noon, a time when nobody, nobody else would really be around, so they would be alone. Jesus is a rabbi who should only be teaching to superior men. And most of all, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan, a person from a group that is viewed by the Jews as the most inferior people. Even the woman herself is confused by Jesus' engaging in conversation with her. She too knows about the socially imposed superiority at play. The point is that if you put this into context, we can see that Jesus is displaying that God's love and grace supersedes all religious and cultural boundaries, especially those that promote superior thinking. We can actually use the ways that this story has been interpreted throughout history as a way of displaying how easy it is to view people with a superior perspective. Many, including myself, have been taught to view this woman negatively because she had been married five times. Anyone who has been married five times is clearly a harlot or at minimally promiscuous, right? Well, not exactly. Again, if we put it into context, it reveals that this assumption is incorrect because marriages ended in one of two ways death by a spouse or by the husband and only the husband authoring a certificate of divorce. In either case, we cannot assume that this woman had any control over what happened. Jesus recognizes this because he knows her past. And because he rejects societal superiority ideals, he sees the woman for who she really is a child of God. Jesus knows how damaging superior judgments can be. He knows that if left unchecked, they can lead to horrible things. It can lead to division, hurt, and even sometimes violence. In this passage, Jesus is challenging those who think they have it or believe their opinions to be truth or superior to another opinions, whether morally or logically. 
He does this a lot in his ministry. He challenges us to see people as God's children. When we think we have it, or we believe our opinions are superior to that of another's, we fall prey to making the other feel like a nobody. The author points this out well because he gives the woman no name, and her gender, religious affiliation, social standing, and personal habits display her socially perceived inferiority. Most people don't want to be nobodies. Christ offers love to all, even the perceived nobodies, so how can we let go of our unconscious superiorities and share Christ's peace and love without that love coming off as a display of power and superiority? Remember, in God's eyes, everyone is a somebody. Everyone is worthy of love. Everyone is equal. During this time of crisis, who are the nobodies that are being shamed or harmed? How can we reach out to them with Christ's love and peace? Now I have to say, I know how hard it is to put aside your opinions and judgments that lead to this unconscious superior thought. I fall prey to it all the time. Additionally, if we refuse to include differing opinions in discussions, we display the same issue of superior thinking. Jesus here reminds us, though, that we must keep engaging in conversation with and allowing those whose ideas and opinions differ from our own to be expressed. For this is how we can now put aside our superior views to truly see people how God sees them. Now putting aside our ideas and opinions does not mean that we shouldn't have our own opinions. It just recognizes that ours is not superior to theirs. Jesus never agreed with the Samaritan woman's understanding of the world, but he still engages in conversation, which through his actions displayed God's way of love and peace, a way that sees all equally as important and equally valued. Perhaps, just perhaps, in this crazy time, we could be the example to the world if we try to recognize everyone as important and their ideas as valid. For in doing this, we are embracing God's way of love and care for one another. Let us remember that we are called to give up our superiority so that we can treat and view others the way God does. May we, during this time of crisis, follow Christ's call to be the hands and voice of God through our actions of love and peace. And may we love and share peace with all people, even those who make choices that we disagree with, so that they don't feel like a nobody. For the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world, amen. Just so you are aware, there was an addition to the list that is not in our bulletin, and I would encourage everyone who can see that list or have that list uh, to add this person, Walt Emery, who found out that his cancer is back, and they will be proceeding to find out what is the next steps. So let us pray. Lord God, Spirit, we know you are present among us no matter where we are at today. We know that you continue to work in this world even though we may not always see it or feel it. Lord, in this time of crisis, you call us to bring up to you all of our concerns and cares, and so we pray for our world. We pray for the anxiety that we could turn to you and be relieved and find the peace and love that you offer. Lord, we lift up to you all of those who you have told us to come to you with, 
Today, we especially lift up Carol, Barbara, Linda, Anne, Jerry, Bobby, Kathy, Sue, Alan, Mary, Nancy, Walt, Brenda and Ron, Maureen, Doug, Jan, all healthcare workers, all people who are on the front lines. Joe Ellen, Sandy, Kathy, Joe, Sydney, Bill, the Gormley family, Ron, Don, Benjamin, George, Joyce, Rita, the Baron family, David, and all of those that we name in our hearts right now in this moment of silence. And now, no matter where you are, in body or in spirit, let us join together saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may you go from here or wherever you are, recalling that Christ offers peace and love, and we, in order to offer that peace and love to others, must first recognize and lose our superior thoughts. Go now with that peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding and love on one another in ways that we may not have thought of before. Go now in Christ's peace. Amen.